So Nate, over the years now that we've been doing the podcast, we've every once in a while had an episode where we just had recommendations. We did favorite business books. We've had favorite tools that we've used. And I think this is another one of those yeah. episodes where we're going to talk through just our personal philosophy around topics such as finance, uh, managing the personal side of your financial goals, retirement, investing, that sort of thing. Now, I just want to say at the front end, we are not trying to be Dave Ramsey here. We are not trying to be Susie Orman. The way we're kind of thinking of this is if Nate and I were sitting down for dinner, which we've done quite a bit, Nate, but if we were yeah. just sitting down for dinner and talking through this area of our lives, um, this is what we would talk about. And so you're going to kind of get a, a chance, very much like some of those episodes we released back in January, um, where you got a look into the BMF hangout that we did at Brooklyn Music Factory back in December. You're just getting a look inside a conversation that's being had amongst a couple of business people. Our goal here is to be quick. We are not going to wax eloquent about debt or stocks or that sort of thing. We're just having a simple, quick conversation about how to think about retirement planning as a small business owner in our industry of music education. So welcome back to the podcast. I'm Daniel. This is Nate. And on the Seven Figure Music School podcast, we like to show you how to run a sustainable, fun music school business. Nate, getting started... Yes. When I pitched this idea to you, you came up with a list of topics that really stuck out to you. I'm curious where you would start this conversation. Yeah, I would start it actually where I initially considered retirement in my plan, which was I was never going to retire. I came into my first career really was as a jazz pianist and all my heroes, Daniel, like they literally played gigs till the day they died. Famously, you know, saxophonist Cannonball Adderley keeled over on the bandstand. Ray Brown, who was a great golfer, loved to golf, mm. um, played a gig, played a round of golf, and then fell asleep and never woke up at his in his hotel bed. Same, all same, mm. you know, same day. So in my mind, I was like, what? I never even talk, we never talked about retirement amongst me and my colleagues as musicians because I just, I mean, I loved what I did. I love playing. I thought I would play for the duration. Mm. Um, so that's kind of where I'd start it because I think over the course of this conversation, Daniel, what I hope to share with our listeners is how I've reframed the idea of, re of retirement in my mind, especially once becoming a small business owner and expanding my community of colleagues. And that really expanded my definition of what retirement could be, how beneficial it could be to me, how beneficial it could be to, you know, Jessica, my wife and my children and that kind of thing. So that's where I'd start. Never thought I'd retire. And uh, here, uh, I'm gonna share how it's changed a bit. Okay, that's, that's awesome. And I will also just say one more thing I meant to say at the top of the episode. We're gonna be talking, more than likely be talking about resources that have influenced us, perhaps books, talks, like that sort of thing. We will make all these available in the show notes. We'll either have like a downloadable PDF because typically on these list type episodes, whenever I listen to one of them, I'm like, oh man, I'm like trying to jot things down. We're going to do that work for you. Or rather, Bethany's probably going to do that work for us. She'll make that resource Thank and you, it'll be Bethany. available. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And that just reminds me to say, you know, if you want to get that resource, you're going to need to head over to gregormusicstudio.com. And um, if you go to, you'll be able to find the latest episode, which is this one. Um, and that would be at, uh, in, in the blog section under podcasts. So anyway, Nate, similar to you, I kind of envisioned my career right out of college as, oh, well, teaching, you just kind of sit there and you talk about music and you teach kids how to play. Like, I, that's not exactly a physically demanding job. I'm going to do this till I'm like 83. You know, <laughs> even if I had, you know, the money, so to speak, to to retire and and seriously scale back my work, why would I want to? But having said that, I had an older mentor in my life pretty much from the time I graduated from college. He's kind of a father, uh, kind of a second father figure to me almost. Um, spent a lot of time with him in my 20s. He was very influential on me. And he introduced me to his financial planner. So at 24 years old, I was speaking to a financial planner 
about my future. And over the years, that influenced my perspective from a very early age. And I started thinking long term from that early age. And in, you know, invested in products or started investing money even in my 20s, albeit a small amount when I was first starting my career. But as I've grown older, I've had more resources to then put into uh, the future, so to speak. So that's kind of where my journey began. I had been working for a while. And when I started doing group lessons and my income kind of shot way, way up, in, relative to the number of hours I was putting in, then I had these side hustles and I was, you know, doing other things and these forms of income. My financial planner said to me, basically, you know what? A lot of the traditional advice that I'm going would give to, you know, someone who didn't own a business, I'm not going to give to you. I don't think that that's good advice for you. You're beating market returns with how your business is doing, and you you have been yes. since you were in your 20s. And so, one of the things that that I did that I think it's a little bit different than the average investing advice was that the money that I quote unquote would have put into a Roth or a 401k, you know, whatever the typical things people would put things into, those got put into this investment vehicle of the business, which has grown over time, the various businesses that, that I've that I've had. So, you know, if I had 500 bucks extra, I would rather put that into ads that would increase the value of the business or the income generate generation. And then, you know, still could invest in the side and in something so I could quote unquote diversify. But yeah, that was kind of the advice that he gave me. I'm, I'm curious how you think about it, Nate, because obviously the school that you have is a bit unusual. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, I love, I love where you went with it, how you started, um, i.e. traditional financial planner, uh, thinking long term, putting some money away. I totally did that. I was, I, I thought I wish I should open a Roth, mm. which I did, because mm -hmm. um, that's the vehicle I could use as a, you know, as a self employed um, pianist. Um, and I, I probably put away a little bit, more, you know, whatever I could in my 20s. Um, but I came to the exact same conclusion as you, Daniel, which was that wait a minute, I'm a builder, I want to invest in things I'm building. And we're, of course, we're skipping over a massive chapter of that acquisition of wisdom because yeah. I didn't have confidence, for example, in Brooklyn Music Factory in years, in the beginning of years, right? <laughs> right. So it's like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like all of a sudden, I mean, you sort of glossed it over for a second. You're like, and then when I switched my model to group lessons and saw a high net return on that, well, of course, that's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of growth that happens to get you to that point. Um, which is what so much of what we do here on this podcast is, is trying to just keep it real in terms of how much we, how much opportunity we have to grow as business owners. However, fast forward, I had the very same thing as, as our net income at BMF started growing. And as we grew and our gross income became a seven figure music school, et cetera. And I started having real faith in our financial projections and where we could go. I was like, why am I, wait a minute, hold on. If I invest in the, you know, S and P or whatever, here's my return on that, right? Mm. Okay, just like your advisor said, um, but I'm getting a totally different return by investing in our own business, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there's a real important uh, distinction to be made here because you use the term side hustle. And I think what happens is that as business owners, especially as small business owners in the initial stages of growth, is that we don't even realize how amazing an opportunity is, mm. the opportunity is that we're building, right? Because we're so mired in the day to day of just trying to get stuff done and stay afloat. Oftentimes, our, our mindset is, well, I'm going to try to keep this thing going. And meanwhile, I'll have all these side hustles. And what we're doing is we're actually like sort of slicing up our focus constantly. And we've talked about this a bunch in some other episodes, but um, rather than really staying hyper-focused on how to grow your business and reach that point where you have faith that the return on a dollar put into, as you put it, Daniel, Google ads is actually higher than the return on just putting away any money you can from a side hustle into long-term investments. 
right? So I'm not suggesting, and I'll I'll be totally transparent about how how we do it in my family in terms of um, saving money in a, in a bit. But um, I do want to double down on your comment that our goal is to create a business that gives us long term uh, return that actually beats the market, the traditional opportunities. Because if it doesn't, okay, we might love what we're doing, Daniel, but why not just take a high paying job, sock away some money and get a, get, you know, 6% on that or whatever you can get on that. And then, you know, put in your 20 years and go on and do something else, then start teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a couple thoughts that spring to mind as you talk about that. First is a quote from Alex Hormozzi. He's like, I don't want to invest in the S and P 500. I want to invest in the S and me 500. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dude, he's the, got good quotes. Yo, he's the best. The idea being that the best investment you can make is in yourself, your own development, your own self-education. And one of those self-education points for me, and I think this is really helpful because I know in our audience, it runs the range in financial fluency from not at all to really sophisticated. And this is one of those things that I think I had to learn even at, you know, at a very, at a very early stage of my career was that just because I went over six figures teaching piano lessons didn't mean that I actually had something that had any long-term value in it. There's a difference between building an asset that has worth and building a cash producing business that maybe doesn't have a lot of value to it. And so I think it's the difference between like an in-home studio I had that was really high income generating, but not a lot of value and what you have built, Nate, there at Brooklyn Music Factory. If you want to further educate yourself on that, I would go back to episode 79 of this podcast, where we talked to Jeff Homer about what is your school worth? For me, what I realized was that, oh yeah, I'm building a cash producing business, but it isn't necessarily something where I'm going to be able to sell this because I'm doing it out of my home. It's very lightweight. There's not a lot of assets that we own. We own some keyboards. We own some musical equipment. I maybe have a couple thousand dollars worth of music that probably only has resale value to other music teachers. you know. And so what I had to consciously do was think of ways to take the cash that I was producing and put aside a certain amount of it into something that could grow in value. What then, what then did I invest in to kind of build that long-term value? And I think that's where we can kind of maybe compare notes and look at the various things that in our own development of ourselves and our own self-education, we found to be valuable. So is that a good place to go now, Nate? What do you think? Yeah, because I think, you know, we've touched on, uh, what was it, episode 12, where we we had five business books we read. That's a great one to just bookmark now. Pause this, pause the app and go bookmark that sucker and go back to it, because I think there's some value there. Um, <clears throat> but while you were talking about self-education, I was digging through my Evernote, and I have an Evernote in there that's just books I've read with all of my notes on the books I've read. And there's one book in particular that I'm going to recommend because – whether or not you're going to follow this thing, um, again, this is not financial advice. This is about business growth mindset shifting. It's called 24 Assets. The basic principle is this, that you are creating a series of long-term value assets within your music school. Mm -hmm. And for a place like Brooklyn Music Factory, we really started doubling down, for example, on sustainable, repeatable systems. We started doubling down on the curriculum that we'd been developing since day one in this very room right here. Mm. Um, and, and that became Big Music Games. That became our mini keys and our Jam Band Pro 101 program. And honestly, reading I've reread that book a few times because I feel like every time I read it, the principle is so valuable for me to be reminded of, which is that in our school, in our small business, we want to be able to create something that will have a long-term value, whether we're there or not. And while you and I are there as business owners in the school, of course, we're going to help drive that objective, right? We're going to help refine systems. We're going to improve systems. We might help develop new curriculum. We might help introduce a curriculum we're licensing into our school and make sure all of our teachers are trained well, et cetera. We'll, of course, have huge impact on the business as long as we're in it. 
right? And that's where you start increasing that net income, that return on the investment in the business. But long view, we want to create something that has uh, a life outside of us, right? That's the basic of E-Myth, another great book, which I'm sure some of our listeners have already read. Um, but E-Myth, is, that's the basic principle there too, right? You're, you're creating a long-term sustainable business. So I thought that was a good segue. I'm going to ping it back to you, Daniel. But 24 Assets is a book. I can't remember the author's name. Apologies. I'll look it up. But 24 Assets, you'll find it no problem. We'll link to it in the show notes. But that's an example of, an, of something that really helped start shifting my mindset around what I was actually building at the music school rather than just showing up to teach a great lesson day in, day out. Mm, that's awesome. That's great. So I think this, the way that I'd like to move into the next segment of this discussion, as I look back at you know almost 20 years now of my career, what were the best financial moves I made? What were the things I look back and like, oh, that was, that was really good. This might be my most controversial thing to talk about. I'm going to lightly touch on it because different financial personalities out there have wildly different opinions. And I've brought this topic up in conversation before in friend groups, and it's almost gotten to like a toxic level of discussion. <laughs> Because it's so polarizing. Anyway, this book that I read when I was very young was called Becoming Your Own Banker. It's by a guy named R. Nelson Nash. And he talks about a very unusual and um, strategy for how to allocate some of your personal finances. It's a safe tax advantage investment vehicle. When most people hear what this is, they become apoplectic with, or when a lot, some people become like almost apoplectic with rage. Oh, no, Dave Ramsey said that's terrible. But the, but the way that, this guy's using it is not the way that most people use it. And he makes a case and I'm kind of a skeptical person by nature. And I read this book over and over and I was trying to find a flaw in his thinking. But as I did the math, I was just like, Oh my word, this guy's right. And so anyway, it has to do with insurance and, and things of that nature. Um, but uh, it's a short book. I recommend it. Uh, I have the original edition. I think a, a second edition has been published since he originally published it. But uh, it's been something where we've been able to kind of rely on this throughout, uh, or I've been able to rely on this throughout my adult life in terms of if I needed to finance something, I didn't have to go to a bank. And uh, it saved me a lot of money and interest over the years. So there's that. Can uh, you tease? Just give us one little, our listeners, just like okay. one little, like a one or two lines. That's it. Just what's one principle or yeah. tactic that they recommend in the book? Just so if our listeners want to read it, yeah. they might be. Might the, summar with the summary is to look at the amount of money you have available and to, and to buy a whole life insurance policy that is in line with something that budgetarily you can handle. And if you set that policy up the correct way, um, it can it can grow tax free in such a way that you can beat market returns. And he shows all like half this book is literally like spreadsheets and tables and and showing how the math of it works out. And then tax free, you can borrow against that policy to finance things like a down payment on a house or to finance a car if you need you need one. He has a whole section there where he's like, look how much money you'll save in interest over the course of your life from age 25 to 65, assuming that you get a new car like every seven years or even like a any car that you would have to finance. And he shows just how much money that you'll save on interest alone. And then because this vehicle grows, the, the investment vehicle, <laughs> not the car, the investment <laughs> vehicle grows in cash value over time. He, he then shows how even while you're borrowing against the value of that cash value, you are actually beating market returns through any given historical period of time. It, it's actually fascinating. And it seemed almost too good to be true. I ran this past people I knew. I ran this past accountants that I was friends with. It was like, oh, yeah. Like literally I was showed this book to friends who who like much better at finance than me. And I was like, can you, can you defeat the argument in this? And then they ended up doing it. <laughs> they so, ended up following the book. Okay. So love yeah. it. I interrupted you. You were about to no. go to another topic, but yeah, that's true. I want to highlight something that you're saying here. This isn't a quick fix. Know that reading the book is not the end. Reading the mm. book is just barely the beginning. 
the one I just talked about was probably the most controversial and probably the longest one. I'm just going to kind of fly through the next ones because I think some of these things will sound very, again, I, I'm not trying to write a finance book here, neither are you, Nate. But, but just as a follow-up, all this came from personal study. And it's one of those things where, you know, I wanted to invest in the S&Me 500. I, I, I wanted to understand the implications. And so I made conscious, I've made conscious choices and continue to make conscious choices to dedicate a portion of my time to just learning about things, being interested in, in the wider world. And I think it's paid off in that, uh, you know, Alex Ramosi kind of blew up in 2023, but I was following him in 2021 before he was a big thing, like just because out of personal research, um, a lot of things that have hit our cultural consciousness, I've been early on just because of an interest in, in, in keeping up with some of these topics around business and money and, and things like that. And it's, I think it's a lifestyle choice. Um, and, you know, I, I'm probably foregoing certain uses of my time, I, you know, I, when I drive and going somewhere, I'm not listening to a fiction book on tape. I'm probably listening to a podcast from a really forward thinking thinker. And I just kind of adopt those mentalities. Um, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm kind of giving a, and this is actually investment advice, an investment of your time, but I'll get back to the money part. My financial planner recommended a tax advantaged investment vehicle called an SEP. And so I buy mutual funds and stocks and things of like that through the SEP. I cannot, for the life of me, remember why it's better than having a Roth. But he said, for me and what I'm doing, it would be better than a Roth IRA. Not necessarily that I wouldn't also get one of those, but he had a specific reason why to do an SCP. So I bet if I went to Investopedia and looked it up, I'd probably remember within a couple minutes. But it's one of those things where I did a little bit of research, agreed with him, did it. Another thing he recommended I invest in was disability insurance, since I'm having to cover myself. You know, what if you're in some accident, you can't teach for six months because you're in physical therapy, like that sort of thing, like your your income goes away, you know? So what if there's a long-term disability? So it's something where you need to take into account the kinds of things that your employer would probably do for you were you to be a traditionally employed person. Uh, and and you have to take into account the 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 value of those things and then do a little research into what it would take for you to have those same protections in place. One other, um, maybe a little bit of a non-traditional vehicle. And again, I found this out because for like one summer in my early thirties, I was hanging out with this real estate investor. Again, an, an older guy, he kind of took an interest in me. He saw how interested I was in finance, that sort of thing. And he, he, we just went to lunch and we're even considering doing like an investment property together. He was just really kind of enthused. I, I think we both gained some things from each other because um, he had a business and I was giving him like marketing advice that was a little bit more forward thinking than what he was thinking at the time. Um, and then I picked up a lot of things from him because he had been very successful in real estate investing. And through him, I discovered this company called Marketplace Homes. And when I found out what they did, it was actually kind of shocking to me. And, and this is something I'm so happy I did. And I, I think I, it would be remiss not to mention this since we're talking about maybe our our best financial moves throughout the years. Um, but essentially, if you were to build a new home, Marketplace comes in and in your previous home, if it fits some pretty loose criteria, you do not sell your old home they will guarantee a lease on that home at market rates for seven years after you build a new home. So the, the house I'm sitting in right now, we built in 2014. And the home that I bought when I was 24 um, that I had been living in since 2007, I didn't sell it. They guaranteed a seven-year lease on it. Uh, and, and initially I think we were making like, a, and this is good for the Midwest, like Nate, you'll hear this rate and you'll be like, wait, that's nothing. That's pennies. It would be in New York, but here it was a good, really good rate. So it was just like a simple, you know, 1400 square foot starter home here in the Midwest, something like that at the time would rent for about 1100. It rents for about 1500 now mm. a month. Um, but you know, at that time, <laughs> uh, you, you know, 
you could buy a 4,000 square foot home here in my state for like $300,000, you know? So like just on the coast, that's unheard of, but here in the Midwest, well, it's different. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah. I was just going to say that 1100 might've covered your future mortgage in your yeah. new home type of thing. That's, that's it fascinating. almost did. It was just shy of what the new mortgage was on a, on a much bigger home. You know, what I like about that story, um, mm -hmm is that it's another vehicle that was of interest to you. Yes. And again, you put in the time through a trusted resource, your friend, mm -hmm. and you mutually benefited one another, which has made the information even more valuable to one another, yeah. you know, to you because you felt like you were getting solid advice from someone who you were trying to benefit as well. And I think this is, this is so important to me, dude. I realized like, mm. you know, I have a sibling and, um, he's been in interested and engaged. He had one of the first podcasts on crypto currency in the called Bitcoins and Gravy. And in fact, when he was doing it, he it was put he uh, it was put on by a publisher who was literally paying them in Bitcoin. And this was I don't even know when it was 14, 15, 16 years ago. And when anyone, of course, always asks, everybody's like fascinated by crypto. And I'm like, look. I'm not interested in it, but I'll tell you what, like my, my brother's been interested in it for a long time and his interest hasn't waned. So of course it's a great investment for him because he's extremely interested in it and he stayed that way for well over a decade, right? Okay, great. Um, we will get return on what we put attention to. That which we put our attention to will grow. And so it gets, it sort of brings me full circle um, back to this, this idea of growing our business and having it be a great investment. So, so, so our like portfolio in my world is pretty straightforward. You know, the, the, the greatest investment I ever made was besides in myself. Daniel was in my home. And I would love yeah. to say that that was intentional, but it wasn't. It just happened to be. This is the home that um, we moved into 28, nine years ago. And uh, it's, not a it's not a pretty story. It's, my dad passed away suddenly, and there was like a $50,000 life insurance check that came. And I took that $50,000. Jessica and I had just moved to Brooklyn and we said, we know this is our home. It felt right to us in our heart. We were like, we feel rooted. She had a great gig. Um, she was an editor at uh, House Beautiful. And I was loving being a, a musician here. Mm -hmm. You know, New York City, if you're a jazz musician, like this is where everybody ends up, at least for a short chapter in their life, you know? <laughs> and so we took that money and I said, let's buy a home because that's our insurance. That's my insurance as an artist that mm. I can stay here. Mm. Right. So I didn't think of it as a long term investment. I didn't think of it as a great return. I didn't think of it as future retirement. I thought of it as I want to be sure that I can continue to make original music, tour, and not have uh, my, uh, my living situation um, be a block. Right. In other words, because rent obviously is something that can be really prohibitive here. Right. So so our home became our most important investment. And most you don't have to, you know, you don't have to Google deep to look to see what what the return on real estate's been in uh, certain markets. Right. Mm -hmm. So in addition, um, just like you said, with, um, you know, with your partner, which was that that like every time Jessica was employed, we just maxed out the contributions. Yeah. You know, which is vital. Um, like as we say at Brooklyn Music Factory, when we 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 offer ret a retirement savings with three percent matching, we're just like, look, this is free money to you. If you can afford to put this, put just a little bit aside, BMF is going to match it. So that could be a free hundred bucks every paycheck, free couple hundred bucks every paycheck to put aside. So just as another side note, like Jessica, my wife works for Brooklyn Music Factory. She's an employee at the company. She joined about six to seven years into the life of the company and we max out her IRA contributions. I think we mm. put something like 13 to 15% aside of her check. 
Um, obviously, I'm an owner, I'm an equity, I'm a co-founder of BMF, so it's a different, you know, it's a different model in terms of my draw, and it can fluctuate. But for her as an employee, she's, she's salaried like our other salaried employees. So it's a combination of real estate, um, a, a, you know, a, biz, a family business, a business that I'm deeply invested in, and now a couple of other business opportunities that I've opened up and continue to do. Uh, in addition to past retirement accounts that we, like I said, when we had a, when Jessica was employed and that was like a decade or two decades of her career, we just were sure to take advantage of that because um, it, it, like you said, it can be so valuable. And that's it. And I, the last piece I wanted to say on this before we get into mm. any other details was this: it is very important. And one of the things I really appreciate, Daniel, hearing your story, is that. As I've gotten to know you much better, I realized like, you know, for example, that last opportunity you said around owning a home, the book you recommended, like this is very in line with the Daniel Patterson I know, right? Like if you find something that you're very interested in, you will stick with it and go very deep and you're extremely consistent and reliable, which is one of the reasons why I think our partnership and this works so well. Right. Because because while I'm an improviser and I like will bounce around and da, 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 you're very like solid. So you come back and like, here we go, Nate. Here's what we're doing next. This is what we said we do. We doing it. Right. And so um, a lot of your choices around um, your investments ring true to me. For me, like I am not interested in becoming great with investments. I just I'm not. I'm way more interested in new ideas and building new businesses. And, and even if those, and I believe at this juncture in my career as a business person that in the Hermosi quote, that I'll get a better return if I invest in me mm. than I will if I say, pick up an, a book and try to really master, um, you know, uh, day trading. Right. So anyways, that's the last piece is like, I'm hmm. much more of a set and forget it. I'm grateful that I can, grateful that we have a home that allows me to take risks in my business, et cetera. But I really truly believe now at 54 that, that I am the best investment for us and new hmm. business opportunities are a great investment. Not saying they're all going to hit, but, I'm, but I have faith yeah. and I have experiential knowledge. So, Well, I love that, Nate. And I think maybe a good way to wrap is just to revisit a word that you used near the beginning, which is this idea of an asset, you know, be aware uh, the, I'm talking to the listener, be aware if you are building an asset or you're building a cash flow vehicle, just even that idea. And if you're simply building a cash flow vehicle, then you need to take some of that cash and put them into assets. And that's some of the things that Nate and I have been talking about for the last 30 minutes a home, real estate investment, uh, putting it into a fund or putting it into, you know, crypto, as you said, <laughs> your brother's done. The way I view it is we need to be at a basic level of fluency so that we know what we're doing so that we don't fall victim to a scam at the most extreme, but so that we just don't make terrible decisions. We have to spend eight hours a day sleeping. That's eight hours that are gone, but we have to use those eight hours or seven or nine or whatever your body needs. We have to use them. Otherwise, it's not too long and we're not going to be on the planet anymore. In the same way, the way that I view it is that there are just some things in life that you have to spend some time doing and you can either not do them and suffer the consequences or you can do them. And so for me, it was like, ah, you know, I need to learn about this. I need to get this part of my life under control. That's kind of the the... You called it consistency, but for me, it's just kind of like this, ah, it's nipping at my heels. I need to learn about this. It'll be well worth the time of anyone. And the earlier you do it, the better. The earlier, the better. Can I tell you a story about my daughter, Josie? Love That's it. directly linked to the earlier, the better. Mm, I wish I had the podcast that she's listening to. It was a woman talking about and giving financial advice. And she came to me and she's like, dad, I want to open up a retirement account. And she, I think she was like 20. And I was like, Really? She's like, yeah, I'm just opening it up. It was given as advice. And, and so, she's, so she asked me what, you know, what to do. And I said, well, um, back to your comment, Daniel, like only do what you think you can sustain. You, know, you need to persevere. You need to sustain and you need to be consistent if you're going to get a return on that. 
right? Things compound if you keep showing up. And so she started putting away, I think, something like $10 a month. You know, and I just asked her a few, like a couple few weeks ago, how's, how's it going? And she's like, oh, it's great. I like, I put, now I put aside something like $30 a month and it's in the same account. And she's like, I haven't been able to increase it lately because I've been in spending money on my studio. She's a painter. I need money to rent the studio, but I still, it still just comes out automatically. And to your point of starting early, I definitely wasn't doing that at 20. At 20, I was in the practice room, right? That's where all my attention was. And it's not that Josie has massive financial fluency. It's not that at all. What it is is that she grew interested. And yeah. like you said, Daniel, there was just a podcast that r- rang true for her, and it, and it was mm. targeted at her, you know? And, and so she took the advice and she implemented. And it was little, sustainable, and it's... Frankly, dude, it's super inspiring to me. I mean, I know I'm biased because it's my older daughter, but still, I'm so inspired that she's still doing it three and a half years later because I, as I tell her, um, I'm like, I promise you, you're in the like 5% or less of your friend group. Yeah, 100%. That been like, I'm going to automatically save every month for this thing. You know, mm. it doesn't matter how big it is or small it is. Yeah, so that's not relevant right now. So, I thought I would share that story. Hopefully, that inspires. Especially if you're if you're a young listener and you're just like trying to be inspired. I mean, Daniel's definitely inspiring to listen to. But take Daniel plus Josie, and that'll be your inspiration to take some action in the next month. Yeah, yeah, and take Nate's advice on building building an asset in the business that you have. Uh, it, it, it's all really good. Mm-hmm.